This is the Roaring Elephant podcast for the 23rd of June. And here is my fully Kubernetesized. Can you Kubernetes eyes something? Kubernetes. I don't know what you're talking about. You could about. Kate I'm something, Exactly. Maybe. I'm totally Maybe. K8S. I mean, I'm not sure what that <laughs> Kuba, Kuba, Kuba something of you is. Acronyms uh, for the win, man. Dear. Come on. <laughs> uh, I really do, just while we're on this topic, I <laughs> no. really do hate the people that call it Kates. It just, it just, I mean... You don't hate, you right, dislike. Right, it. No, I, I, no, I really hate. <laughs> you found a lot of hatred. Yes. In me. Yeah. Oh, uh, I don't know that I quite. No, that's for you. That's more of a, like a a deep seated, burning loathing of blockchain. Whereas I just, yeah, I hate a lot of things. Anyway, moving on. We are. The reason Kubernetes came up is because the U.S. Air Force is going to be using. Um, Kubernetes, actually there's going to be a Kubernetes cluster embedded in uh, an upcoming uh, piece of hardware they're developing, the B-21 Stealth Bomber. And uh, what has this led to, Jan? We should ban Kubernetes and Google must die and everybody should suffer because no way open source should be available to people that I don't like. Something like that? Uh, Pretty... (laughs) Pretty much, yeah. It's, I was paraphrasing, it's, paraphrasing people. That wasn't my personal opinion, okay? <laughs> but I mean, the, sure. in the same way that you know, a lot of Google staff um, you know, protested about um, you know, Google working on uh, AI for drones, um, the image there is thing. a... Yeah, there's, there's, uh, um, there's a lot of uh, expectation that there will be similar... Um, complaints and uh, concerns about this but I honest I mean I get the oversimplified view that people might have on this but I think this is one of those topics that bears just a, a moment's um, hold on the vitriol the pitchforks and the flaming torches and just just think about this realistically for just a handful of seconds right? this I mean this particular example is the US Air Force but is there any world that exists where where no military force ever has ever used Kubernetes? Like yes, I don't. Yes, uh, in the minds oh of the people that built Mesos. <sighs> Dear. Anyway, <laughs> moving on from that. Um, yeah, no, you're right. It's all right. It's all right. They're being bought by Kubernetes by Google anyway. Apparently. Anyway, <laughs> so yes, the. Um, the the point here is that like the US Air Force probably like significant chunks of the design and the, the computational fluid dynamics that I mentioned two episodes ago and a whole bunch of other stuff may well have even been done on Kubernetes clusters already. Like the fact that a Kubernetes cluster is embedded in this, what the, the differentiation between that and Kubernetes as a technology being heavily used by that same organization to probably design it, probably do lots of other cool things that the the armed forces do. Um, I just, I can't, I can't sort of understand the, the sort of the delineation that goes through people's minds about why that is different. And maybe it's not, maybe they, they don't, maybe they just don't realize that, you know, organizations like the, the US Air Force and I'm sure the army and everybody else is is using Kubernetes very heavily already. Yeah, it's the whole ethics thing, right? I mean, it, it's, a, it's a tough one. I mean, on the one hand, I, I do understand why people get this reaction because, uh, I, I mean, I made something cool and people can do nice things with it and then suddenly the army uses it. I, yeah, I mean, in a world, perfect world, there would be no armies and I would happily join that world every day. No problem there at all. Sure. That being said, it's a part of the of the of the world, sadly. And yeah, I mean, if it's open source, and even if it's closed source, I mean, a lot of closed source software got f- founded by by defense uh, things uh, contracts in the first place. I mean, a lot of um, innovation is actually originating, maybe not from the military organizations themselves, but definitely from their funding. 
And yeah. uh, one very specific uh, example I have, I know about is uh, Apache NiFi. We've been talking less about Apache NiFi lately for some reason, but we're still big fanboys of it. And it's actually something that was open sourced by the NSA. Yeah, that's not military. Well, yeah, big difference, I guess. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, Kubernetes, I mean, it's like saying they're not allowed to use aluminium or steel in their airplanes. Because, uh, come yeah. on. I mean, I mean just, just, just think about the amount of research dollars that have been spent on stuff that has seen general application that's come from places like DARPA. Mm -hmm. um, it, it just... This is just one of those things that I... Yeah, I, 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 do, I do kind of get the... your sort of... It, it's about ethics, but it's also... You it's can't reality. control... Yeah, you can't control... You can't release something to the world... And then say, oh, but but I don't want you to use it. I don't want you to use it. And we've had we've had this conversation on a previous episode mm -hmm. when people actually tried to manipulate the open source licenses of their of their services and tried to say, oh, but certain organisations can't use it. Like, it's it's illegal. Yeah, you, you can't can put that in, but then it's not open source. Yeah, you you have fundamentally like it's no longer that license. It's something new, something different. So this you need fine. to remove all mentions. Yeah, which is that's why um, proprietary organisations are absolutely um, entitled to going ahead and and putting weird and wacky clauses about certain organisations not being able to use them. You have things like um, you know trade agreements between certain certain countries. And you have sort of certain embargoes that certain things cannot be sold to certain countries by other countries and things like that. But outside of those relatively niche kind of things, and especially in the world of open source, once something is out there, anyone can use it. And if if you're naive enough to think that, you know, your little project that you did, okay, maybe, maybe it depends on the type of project, maybe certain projects, you know, automatic generation of cute, fluffy pictures of penguins maybe um, maybe that is unlikely to be used by the military but you know anything like something you know so fundamental as Kubernetes like it's going to be used by anyone and everyone yeah for me it's also a positive because uh, one of those planes they're pretty complicated pieces of kits I would imagine and the fact that they're actually putting Kubernetes in a bomber which is going to be I mean, the definition of an air capped environment, I guess. If something goes wrong, it's not like you can call IT to kind of fix your computer. Apparently, Kubernetes is stable enough that it's fit for a task in that kind of yeah high requirement environment. I think for me, it does make Kubernetes a bit more mature. Uh, I mean, it does make it more mature, but it gives me the perception of it being more mature than it was before I read this. So maybe this also means that Kubernetes will be used more across the world and doing good things in the world. So it doesn't all have to be bad. Yep. And, you know, yeah, I, I think that that's... I think that is fair. I think that we'll, you will see... Um, you continue to see enhancements going into Kubernetes, you know, because of these kind of things. It's just... Uh, it's just the way the, way the world works. And also on a personal level... Uh, now that this happens, and obviously they're downloading this Kubernetes directly from GitHub onto the Stealth Bomber, I'm, I can't wait to see the first article that a Bitcoin miner was installed on a B21 Stealth Bomber. Has to happen. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> anyway, moving on. Moving, moving on. on. To, to one of Jon's favourite topics. No, it's not blockchain. It's quantum. Worse than talk that. to us about talk to us about the quantums. What have the quantums done today, Jon? Well, apparently the quantums are bad, and people are trying to stop them already. Uh, it's an uh. article I found online uh, by a Dutch uh, government uh, in innovation institute, whatever you want to call those things. And when I first read it, it's kind of a little double take because the article kind of said they were working their hardest and innovating as much as they could to stop quantum computing. Now, me, simpleton as I am, I thought the world was trying to get towards quantum computing to make these things work and actually do something for a change because, believe it or not, quantum computing still does not exist. The things that they say that it does, well, it's all simulated and very, very niche 
and not really what quantum computing has to be. Quantum supremacy has not been attained yet, but still this uh, Dutch uh, organization was already working to stop quantum computing and more specifically the quantum encryption or even more specifically the breaking of encryptions by quantum computers, which allegedly, because again it doesn't exist yet, will be possible in the let's call it somewhat near future maybe we'll see when it happens if it happens but on the other hand yeah i said there was double take because yeah i can imagine i can see why this is also important and it kind of got me wondering is today the, the the people that are working in the quantum computing area are there more people trying to build the thing or more people trying to kill it before it gets started <laughs> I, I, I tell you, the largest portion of people and the quantums are still trying to work out what it is. <laughs> that's, that's the large... There's, there's a very tiny portion of people creating the quantums, there's a tiny portion of people trying to kill the quantums, and there's a giant mass of people going, what are the quantums? Uh, I have definitely that latter category. Yeah, well, quantum mechanics has been known for a while now, so if you haven't read up on that one yet and you think you're uh, with the times, I invite you to go into YouTube and look at some videos. There's a lot of stuff available these days. It that's, is going that's to where you repair your car with really, really tiny tools, isn't it? Yes? <sighs> no, no, that's nano. It's not quantum. <laughs> quantum is smaller than nano, man. The thing about quantum, <laughs> quantum, quantum mechanics allows you to take a mirror cut out half of the surface of the mirror and still see the full image. Well... Cut out half again. It's cutting down the price of bathroom furniture. Got it. Quantums make bathrooms cheaper. Got it. I understand. Awesome. See? That's all you need to tell me. (laughs) Can you cut a tap in half and still get all the water out? Does that... Is it... Does Um, it... Can you cut a bath in half and just... No, but you could make the reflection of it still work. (laughs) <laughs> well, that's not very useful. So that's that's, that's definitely thing, less useful. Quantum is going to be a lot less useful than most people think. Because a lot of people think that they're going to replace their computers, their Intel or AMD CPUs with a quantum chip and it's going to be uh, a zillion times faster doing stuff, whatever, playing, um, I don't know, uh, what's the most, uh, Candy Crush, even faster than before. <laughs> I was looking at the most in game I could think of. <laughs> uh, but uh, quantum will never be used in that way. It will always be kind of like a, like a graphics card. It's going to be an add-on thing which you add on top of your existing CPU because the whole idea behind quantum, quantum computing is that whatever a normal chip can do today, quantum will be rubbish at. That quantum is specifically meant to do the stuff that the normal CPUs can't do. They don't. Mm. They will never do everything. I mean, never say never. Give them another 100 years. I have no idea what we're going to be doing. Hopefully I won't be around anymore. Um <laughs> But the, the 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 applicability of quantum computing, yeah, it's a buzzword. Everybody's looking at it. But if you really look at what it's actually doing, how what the realms of application are, it's actually quite narrow. And nobody's even pretending it's going to be a generally used thing. It's never going to be part of your lawn lawnmower to make sure the grass is cut at the exact oh. precise length. Yeah, I'm sorry to disappoint and you. Now. There. Now I want a quantum lawnmower. Is that is that would a quantum lawnmower have been have been ridden by the lawnmower man? I think so. Yeah, but only in cyberspace. Yeah, and yeah. not on lawnmower but, I mean, man two because that was a rubbish movie. Uh, no, lawnmower lawnmower man two doesn't exist in the same way that the Matrix two and the Matrix three. Yeah, but that's quantum, exist. right? It both exists and doesn't exist at the same time. That's the whole no, 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 doesn't exist. <laughs> doesn't exist. Not talking about it anyway. Moving on, moving on to the latest in a long line of why on earth would you do that, you moron? I know, I've done this. I'm not a moron. I learned my lesson. I'm not doing it again. Uh, I mean, this is the only... I was going to say the only positive thing about this is that hopefully people will learn a lesson from it. But uh, that, that... you just need to go again. Go back two episodes and hear us talking about sequel injection. Clearly, people don't learn. So, not in two weeks' let's, time. Let's, <laughs> let's go. Let's let's go around this this merry-go-round one more time. How um, else can you move your money to places you don't want it to end up? Well, it's not just money. It's it's everything, isn't it? Like okay, so let's let's go back to let's go back to the fundamentals. We have this we have this thing called source control. It's very good. It Make sure that people know what they're doing with their source code and that you can contribute code that doesn't collapse other people's code and all sorts of fabulous stuff. 
And then this this source code control became something that you could do on the internet. Wow, even more fabulous. And in the public eye and and uh, all things Git and GitHub were born. Wonderful. Now, what do you think is some of the worst types of information you could put in something public that is very easy for someone to programmatically download and scan through? Well, the only thing I put on GitHub is configuration scripts. Nothing wrong with that. No, no, like no. Unless those configuration names. scripts are Offer. absolutely thoroughly plastered with authentication and authorization <laughs> information, and even you know your um, your cryptocurrency, you know wallet, wallet strings. details, and oh God, when will people stop being quite so stupid? And it hurts enough. <sighs> It clearly hasn't... Yeah, you're right. It clearly hasn't <laughs> hurt enough yet. <laughs> Little Bobby Drop Tables has, has come back for one more one more round. I just... I mean, so this... Th- there's lots of things that bother me about this. Clearly, I'm clearly getting quite <laughs> yes, annoyed I'm, I'm, about I'm this. I'm backing away. I'm backing away from the fire. <laughs> Nothing. So, like, the fact that this is news actually annoys me. Um, the fact that this is happening definitely annoys me. Um, the fact that it's uh, happening the fact so that often that people actually have scripts ready to capture people that do the oh. same stupid thing again and again. Yes, yeah. I mean, you you can you can see it on your. I mean, I'm a. We famously talked about this a number of times. I am like a terrible developer. I'm possibly the worst developer that anyone has ever met. But even I can imagine something relatively simplistic that would look for, you know, known formats, you know, known configuration files, would look for known stanzas or it's keywords or whatever. And, and, you know, yeah, whether it's a regex or however you look at it, we would look for these various different things and you would just dump these things out, plow them into something, some API that is then calling these things, and then, yeah, before you know it, you've got yet another data breach or yet another uh, and it goes very fast because the article you found on this actually had a, uh, a, a happening of this thing where somebody puts a, pushes a change of a config file that contained wallet uh, information to GitHub and 100 seconds later, his wallet was plundered. Yep. So again, this must, this must be happening so often that hacker groups apparently are just continuously trolling the whole GitHub database to get that stuff. And this is on the public uh, GitHub's right. And don't forget that a couple of months ago, GitHub actually made private repositories also free to use to, to certain sizes. So even if you want to put stuff up there, then at least take a private thing. Be careful. I mean, the internet doesn't forget. And that's another one, of course. Uh, don't think, oh, mm-hmm. I uploaded this uh, config file with my password. I'll just remove it here and push it again. And now it's gone, right? It's a version control system, people. It doesn't forget. That was my mistake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just it's one of those it's one of those things that just keeps coming around and around and around. And I unlike some of the yeah, you know, we would we again, 2 weeks ago we were talking about SQL injection and I I think there is something that you could do on that front to you know the default way of implementing anything is, you know, it it would it would naturally um, it would naturally sanitize the fields. Like you would not be able to perform SQL injection. That that is something that you could systemically across all Sorry libraries to begin there, but to implement. That actually happens already because there's a number of lo- of programming language that will throw up a syntax error if you type something that would allow SQL injection by just concatenating yeah. two strings from an input field. That's already there. It's just people yeah. have to want to use it because most people, most I'm not going to say most people, a lot of people disable that because it's more work. Yeah. But so but the, there is there is something systematic you could do for that. So the only the only other thing I can think of with this particular, you know, case where, I mean, yes, GitHub could have an additional service that would yeah. reject um, code that had, 
know that that sort of information in it. But you can all, just just like you you've explained, Jan. You could also imagine that's the first thing that people. Oh, my my code's not getting pushed up because there's a false positive on this. I'll just disable that permanently, and then it'll all be fine. I mean, sure, you have to protect people against certain things. Uh, definitely, we're in a, we're in a welfare state. We have that kind of yeah solidarity whatever it's there but some things are still up to the person right i mean yes you can put it onto github that they they should sanitize the input or give warnings come on at a certain point it's up to the person uploading stuff because it forget, is uh, github shares stores a lot more stuff than just um uh, what you call a source code some people yep. use it to back up their systems which is the yep. most stupidly horrendous thing you could ever think of doing i think but let's not go there but I mean, you can't put it up. It's easy enough. I mean, every good coder, every good, definitely if you're somewhat professional, you have unit testing, you have all kinds of test suites that check your code on uh, backwards compatibility, uh, breaking stuff, uh, whatever, regressions. It's easy enough to put a small check in there to just make sure there's nothing, the same regexes that the hackers are using to get it out of GitHub, you can do it locally before you push it, right? Yeah. But again, yeah. people. And I'm guilty of that too. I mean, the main reason I became a information technology expert, whatever you want to call it, is I'm lazy. If I can make a computer do the stuff for me, I prefer o- automate that. Automate all the things. <laughs> exactly. Automate all the things. Good sysadmin, you make your job obsolete every 14 days. That's basically mm-hmm. why I entered this field. And yeah, there's a point where it becomes too easy. Just yeah, click, 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 and it's gone, and it's done, and go away. And the, the, the positive thing, I mean, the, the, the optimist in me, I, I must say I see uh, things getting better. And uh, I actually just finished a little project I did for a, a non-profit organization here. And they insisted I wrote it in PHP. Now, I used a lot of PHP in the day. It was okay-ish, but over the years, PHP has gotten a very bad name uh, that it's unsafe. SQL injections, for instance, are very prevalent in PHP and stuff like that. And I was really mm-hmm. fighting against them and asking them, can't I do it in Python? Because Python is a real programming language and PHP isn't. Okay. Uh, no, we can't. Okay, 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 we'll do it in PHP. So I went looking again. It had been a while. And if you look at the current um, frameworks, and basically today, if you build something, you will be using a framework, be it the, the .NET framework or the PHP framework or the Ruby framework. You, you won't be writing everything from scratch. Nobody does anymore. If you take a look at the, the recent frameworks, and I use Laravel in this case, I liked it. If people's looking for PHP frameworks, Laravel, check it out. I was I enjoyed it a lot. A lot of stuff is baked in. Things like SQL injection are pretty much impossible unless you do more work. So I do think that the message is getting through and newer stuff. Mm. And from now in the next decade, I would expect things to get better because people have been people are starting to protect people from doing stupid things but that being said every automation every the more complex the frameworks become the more possible traps and pitfalls are in the frameworks that could be exploited again because yep. it becomes less uh, understandable comprehensible what the thing does in the back end and again the lazy CM, I don't care how it does in the back end I'll just use the framework and let it do it for me and there's an inherent risk in that of course as well so it's, uh, you, you lose if you do, you lose if you don't. It's We're doomed. As you said last time, the human race is doomed. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. <laughs> and on that glorious, sunny, happy note... <laughs> I guess Dave says that that is all the time you have for today and maybe for the rest of time as well. <laughs> You can always support this podcast. You can become a patron. You can talk about us. You can write blog posts about us. Every contribution helps. We're on YouTube, you can like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, do all that stuff that Dave likes so much. You can go to www.roaringoff.org. You can find a link to the Patreon page, the YouTube page, and a lot more information about the podcast. And you can follow us on Twitter using the at Roaring Elephant tag, and you can send feedback to podcast at roaringelephant.org. Simple email also still works. Until next time, my name is John. And my name is Dave. And we look forward to talking to you next week. Goodbye. See you then.